All right, and welcome everybody. Today is Thursday, August 3rd. Um, I was still saying July as of yesterday. I can't believe it's already August. August 3rd, 2017. Uh, this is the Every Thursday webinar where we review any open Q&A uh, questions and answers that anyone has. So if you're on the line right now, and you're sitting there and you do have anything, it's very important. Type the questions into the chat box now. Um, you can definitely do so as well as we go along. But the more questions I get in there in the beginning, the easier it is for me to kind of go through everything. So um, I'm going to start out with what has come in so far. And I also want to ask everybody who's on the call really quickly, what training do you guys need like for the people who have gone through all of the videos that um, the onboarding videos that we give on day one what do you feel like there's a gap on because I'm I'm looking to do additional training and I'll probably add that into the Dropbox and ClickFunnels folder so let me know what type of topics what type of subjects what you feel might be missing from the information after you've already gone through it so if you can uh, just put that in there, um, I would appreciate it. And then I will start to create some content around that. So um, I'm going to jump right into the questions and go from there. All right, so first question, Steve, can I get a link or copy of the mind maps that you utilize in the videos? I use MindMeister as well. Um, do I have much? Okay, so there's two different questions there, but that, that was the first question is, can you get a copy of the MindMeister? I don't know any way to share them, and I've got probably 500 to 1,000 mind maps in there, and I'd have to go through them one by one. So it would take a lot of effort to do it, and I'm not sure what the easiest way to even go about doing it would be. So um, the short answer probably to that would be no, unless there's some really important reason why you would actually need them. Uh, Chris, do I have much of a shot at a deal with someone who has been looking at Zillow and comparing their property to what their neighbor sold their property for they they seem to be wanting retail price. Okay, so a couple things about seller leads in general. Every seller looks at some data point, whether it's Zillow, their neighbor's house, the assessed value, etc. In 99.99% of cases, these numbers are going to be higher than what an investor offer is. Okay? So that's that's, you know, for for starters is that no matter who they ask or what data point they look at, our offer is typically going to be lower. So um, the second point of that is you saying that you think they want retail price, 90% of sellers sell retail and or want retail pricing. So that's extremely common that a seller will want retail pricing. It's extremely common that they will compare it to Zillow, that they'll compare it to realtor.com that they'll compare it to any sort of data point out there. So it's it boils down to just a numbers game. 10% of the people that you bump into are going to be willing to take an investor offer and the other 90% are going to want retail. Chris, I know you're a licensed agent. So when you go out there, all that you need to do is compare the two, compare and contrast the pros and the cons of selling to an investor versus listing a property. And at the end of the day, 10% of them are going to think that the investor offer is a better opportunity. The other thing I want to mention is that um, when comparing to something like Zillow, 
Zillow is not accurate. So you can't totally discount Zillow because a lot of sellers are going to look and they're going to see what Zillow says. But as we know, Zillow is not accurate. So what Zillow does, you have to really understand how Zillow works. Zillow is an algorithm that pulls in comps and uses adjustments based on square footage and bags and bathrooms. So Zillow provides the best source of value that you can get within five seconds. But when anyone's thinking about selling their house, you don't want to sell your house based on a five second evaluation, right? So some of the things that Zillow, <clears throat> reasons Zillow is not 100% accurate. First and foremost, Zillow cannot see the condition of your house. So if the property is in poor condition and you go out to the property, um, for sure, there, there, there's going to be no way that the Zillow is going to know what the condition of the property is. So Zillow doesn't know whether your property is a 4 out of 10 condition or a 10 out of 10 condition. And the way that I explain it to people in the Boston market, and I'm sure this is true in your market as well, the average home in Massachusetts was built between 1880 and 1920. So literally on one street, two exact same houses, there can be a $100,000 to $150,000 differential because of the condition of the property. Okay, so Zillow doesn't know the condition. Zillow doesn't know if the data on public records is accurate. Okay, so is the square footage right? Are the beds and baths right, etc. Public records is typically off. Um, by how much, we don't know. You won't know until you actually get into the property, but public record is typically off and Zillow is pulling in public record. The other thing Zillow doesn't know is if a property, let's say for example, if the property is a three bedroom, all three bedrooms are not created the same. So one bedroom might be eight by eight, eight feet by eight feet. Another bedroom might be 20 by 20, right? And so there's a huge difference between those two properties, between those two bedrooms. So Zillow is gonna give the same exact value to an eight by eight bedroom as it would give a 20 by 20 bedroom. For all of these reasons I just mentioned, I would actually explain that to the seller and then use that use that to to educate them. Um, sometimes Zillow will work in our favor. So once in a while, um, somebody will have added an addition on, or they'll have a garage that Zillow didn't know about. And sometimes the value can work in our favor, but um, in a lot of cases in this market, it's going to work against us on the investor side. But you just have to fully understand it and then realize that it's a numbers game. Jewel, can you explain the exact process of the wholesale process after you get the contract from the seller? Okay, wholesale process. Okay, so step one, get a contract with the seller that says your name or assignee. So for example, it will say, let me actually pull up my contract just so you can see what that looks like. And this small verbiage here is going to allow you to assign the contract.
Okay, so this is an actual deal that we did. And as you can see right here, it'll say an entity name. So this is an entity that I own, Granix Family Trust LLC, the address of my of my business, or it's assignee. So this this verbiage here allows you the ability to assign a contract. Okay? So that's step one. Get a contract with a seller that has your name and or assignee. Step two, find the buyer. Step three, assign the contract to them. And let me just see if I can pull up, if I have an assignment contract that I can show you. Okay, so this is an assignment contract. It's a one-page document. This is actually somebody in my market who assigned the property to me. So in this case, this person, uh, JS2 Homes, assigned to Ocean City Development. So this person was a wholesaler and then wholesaled it to me. One-page document explaining everything um, and explaining uh, the amount that I paid, the earnest money that I paid, etc. So it's a one-page document that you're going to be signing. So this person, JS2 Homes, put a property under contract with a, a document that said JS2 Homes or its assignee, and then they brought the deal to me, and then I signed this contract in order to close on the property. Now that this assignment has been, now that this doc, now that this property has been assigned to me, now I am the person that closes on the property. And when I closed on this property at 14 Knollwood in Tewksbury, um, I I paid it and then I paid him. So that's pretty much um, as simple as it is. There's nothing really too much more complicated than that in terms of the, the functions. Uh, Jewel, um, follow up to that. Oh, okay. So the follow-up to that, she asked, what if the person who's buying it wants an inspection? Won't that confuse the seller up front? Yeah, I mean, you know, any cash buyer, if they're talking, if you're talking about a walkthrough, that's different than an inspection. So if you're talking about a formal inspection where they actually get somebody to inspect the property, like a licensed inspector, that's not the buyer that you want. And if you're talking about just doing a walkthrough, then you have to be very clear with a seller um, that you're going to be getting people through the property and you're going to have like a one-time open house. And the way that you want to do that, the easiest way to do that, and the way I do it when if we end up wholesaling a property is I'll put the property under contract and I'll say to the seller, you know, either myself or someone in my network is going to buy it. So in a worst case scenario, I'll buy the property from you and in most cases, I don't really want to wholesale myself anyways. But um, in a worst case scenario, I will buy the property. And if not, for whatever reason, if I get busy with my contractors are tied up or capital is tied up for whatever reason, then I'm going to sell it to somebody in my network. And I just need an hour, you know, in a weekend to get a bunch of people through the property. It's a one-time thing. And then that'll be the last time you'll ever have to open the house up to anybody else. All right, Steve, the question might have been answered in a video. If so, I missed it. Within the Internet Lead Action Plan, are the various steps automated, or I, do I need to manually initiate each step? All right, I will open that up right now in follow-up, boss, just so you can actually see it. All right, so an action plan, for those of you who are kind of uh, newer to working with me, it's basically an autom automation. And so if you go in here, if you go into follow up boss, you go into here and then you go into action plans, you will see that there's a bunch of different action plans and action plans automate things. So in follow up boss, an action plan will automate emails and prompt you to make calls. So in the case of the internet lead action plan, 
what you'll see is that the second that a lead comes in, zero days after the action plan starts, which means immediately, it's going to prompt you to make your first phone call. It's also going to send an email, and it's going to send the internet lead number one email. And then you can, if you want to see what that email says, you can go into this part and you can go into email templates and then you would look for internet lead number one and you can see what it says. Okay. The second day, um, one day after the lead comes in, it's going to prompt you to make your second call. Okay. And then two days after, it's going to prompt you to make your third call. And then three days after, it's going to send off the second email. So internet lead number two email. So all that you really, you don't have to worry about emails. Um, like when we say call, text, and email every day for the first 10 days, you actually don't have to worry about emailing. You just have to worry about calling and texting because the emails are going to be done automatically. Jason, following up to the wholesale process, do you, rec do you suggest getting a title search before marketing the property? Absolutely not. Um, because that's going to be money out of your pocket. First of all, title issues are fairly rare. Um, I'm not saying they don't happen, but they're, they're not that common. It's not like 50% of the properties that you put under contract are going to have title issues. And to do the title search, you're going to have to pay money. And then if you don't know whether or not you're going to make money out on the deal, you're going to be putting up more money. Uh, for without knowing so every single person like when this person again when this person assigned the contract to me he didn't do the title work at all I had to do it so me as the buyer I paid for it and in a worst case scenario for this particular deal for JS2 homes the only thing he had at risk was his deposit I would have put up the money for the title search there's there's I would not as the end buyer I would not have gotten refunded if there was a title issue. So that's on the buyer, but it's not very common, so it's not really something I would probably put too much thought into on day one. Jewel, um, as an agent, I was advised by our legal counsel to go through a company when purchasing for ourselves to get full protection with our E&O insurance, which means I will be the buyer's agent representing myself. In that case, it's me being a buyer's agent buying from a FISBO. In that case, would the seller need to do the normal stuff like disclosures and all the other paperwork? What paperwork should the seller expect to do when selling to us? So this is going to be something that state by state is a little bit different and given the fact that you're already in a brokerage with the legal counsel I'm sure that they can give you the full information on what needs to be signed and what doesn't um, I mean the the only document in terms of like what matters is the purchase and sale so the purchase and sale is the number one two and three thing that is gonna that is where you make your money but what you're talking about is as a licensed agent, compliance-wise, what needs to be done. And I think the best thing to do, rather than me um, give you guidance on something in California that's going to probably be different than what needs to be signed in Massachusetts, I think going directly um, to, to your company, the brokerage that you work for, they're going to be able to give you more guidance on that. But for the seller, it's not a matter of does the seller need those documents. The seller doesn't need you to you know, the seller doesn't need all those disclosures for themselves. They don't need that to sell the property. It's just a matter of licensure law in your state. If you're an agent and you're buying a property, you you probably do need to disclose that you are an agent. And that document would be signed, you know, like at the time that they're signing the purchase and sale. But definitely, you know, your your brokerage should be able to tell you more about that. Steve, within a video, I saw that you utilize RealFlow. Is it worth getting? No, it's not worth getting for you because you have access to it with working with us. So everything that we have, any software, any tools, any training, you have access to it. So RealFlow, you have access to it. 
Um, the, the only thing that we use RailFlow for is to look up mortgage balances. I, you know, it's kind of crazy just to have one software for mortgage balances, but that is the only thing that we use it for. RailFlow has a lot of different um, components to it. It's, it's utilized mainly as a CRM, and um, Follow-Up Boss serves that purpose for us. Follow-Up Boss, in my opinion, is a, is a better CRM. So that's the one that we utilize. RealFlow, definitely it we're just using right now just for the mortgage balance data. And Steve, you might already have access to that information yourself in your state. In some states, it's really easy to get the mortgage balance information. In some states like mine, is not quite as easy. So it's kind of just a shortcut for us to get that. So Keep typing questions in, guys. I think I, I hit on everything that was typed in, so I'm going to go right into the Facebook group. For those of you who have not been posting in this Facebook group, this is the best way to get your questions answered on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you go in here, if you go into the questions for Tom, if you go to www.questionsfortom.com, and then type a question into here, you will get your questions answered. So we've got a couple people that are looking to come into the group. Uh, Jewel, we are getting a list of seniors to call on. What's a good criteria? Age, equity, et cetera. Okay, so we can do that list for you if you want. Um, the, the the best criteria, the easiest criteria, are 50 equity, 50% LTV or less. So someone has 50% or more equity in their property. Age, we usually do 50 plus. Length of time, the home greater than five years, and then after that, we, we tend to remove a lot of high assessed value properties. So for example, in Boston, we like to buy stuff in the 300 to 400K range. If we have a property in Boston that's assessed over 600K, we're probably gonna remove it because of the fact that um, there's two reasons why we don't like high-end properties. Um, high-end properties have a smaller pool of buyers. They require more capital, and the owners are more affluent, less financial stress. So those are the filters that we put on we can run this for you in your market if you need us to. If you have um, an easy way to do it yourself, um, you can do it yourself, and I'd be happy to have more input on that list. But um, what's a good number of people to have on our list for Mojo? Mojo to make cold calls. Depends on... The number of people that you need in your mojo list depends on how many hours you're realistically going to put in. So the, the inside sales agents that call for us call for seven to eight hours a day, right? So for most of you, that's not going to even be realistic. Typically speaking, our inside sales agents are hitting 100 calls an hour. So in the period of about one quarter, so every three months, one of our ISAs needs about 20,000 records, but they're doing a ton of calling. So for, for somebody like you over the course of a three month period, you may need more like 5,000 records. And so the way to get those records is, the easiest way to get those records is just to order them directly from us. We can get the cell phone records at 15 cents a record, which would be $750. But I probably would not recommend <clears throat> buying all 5,000 records on day one. So I would do a smaller batch. 
I would do maybe like a batch of about a thousand just to get you started and just so that you know that you're gonna do it so like every like a lot of people will will say that they're gonna cold call and then they decide you know at some point that it doesn't make sense for them or they don't have the time or they don't like doing it so I wouldn't want you to commit to too many records up front and then have them kind of be a waste so um, next question is it smart to hire someone to do inside sales to increase the calls yes 100 percent so I don't recommend that anybody on this call do their own calls like I, I don't think it's a good use of your time cold calling in general is a very basic um, function and it can be done by anybody and so um, we have a bunch of people that can do these calls for you so like we could break it down for you like if you the, we we pay them on average somewhere between two thousand and twenty five hundred a month in guaranteed pay so that's for a full-time person so if you could commit to even like half of that like a thousand to 1250 a month we could give you a half of a person which would provide you with somewhere around a lead a day or a lead every other day somewhere in that vicinity so that is probably what I would more recommend doing if you have the financial resources now not everybody has the financial resources on day one to do that so if you I, I was on a call with somebody yesterday 21 year old kid um, who wants to get into the business and he doesn't have any financial resources so he's gonna have to be the one um, to to do that which is totally fine but for for somebody who's more established either financially or more established in the business it's not gonna make sense for you to really do this yourself because you're not going to be able to commit the amount of time that you need. Um, do you have a script? A script to help the people we hire. Yeah, the script is simple though. So we're not, when we cold call, like when, when I have an ISA cold call, it's very basic. Um, we are not looking to establish rapport. We're not looking to even book an appointment or having in-depth conversation. The ISAs are kind of like the first line. So the, the purpose of an ISA on a cold call is to just to identify the people who may be interested in selling. So when they're calling, they're just saying something simple like, hi, this is Tom from Ocean City Development. We're buying properties in your neighborhood right now. Would you consider an offer? And if they say yes, then they're going to ask a few other questions. Okay, great. What's your time frame for selling? Um, what's your price point? How many beds? How many baths? Great. Okay, is it possible for somebody in our office who can come out and meet with you, give you a call? And then they'll dump the call into follow up boss. That's the only purpose of the ISA. So typically speaking, when an ISA is making 600 to 800 calls in a day, they may get two to three people who answer yes so if you're doing the cold calling yourself you're spending a lot of time just basically sitting there waiting for these two or three people and the role of the inside sales agent is to get these two or three people dump them to you and then for you to work the lead so the script what I just gave you is really it um, in terms of like what the scripting is for them All right, so let's see what other questions we have in the group. Tomoji, when calculating offer, would a 70% 70, 70 of ARV minus renovation costs include a hard money loan um, of, say, 8% on borrowed money, or would that need to be added to the above equation? So the 70%, so the formula that he's talking about is taking 70% of the after repair value minus the renovation cost 
and that formula gets us to what we call our max allowable offer which is the maximum amount that we can pay for the property so it does factor in financing so we factor in a 12 percent um, 12 percent cost of borrowed money uh, to Moji, if you can get eight percent that's awesome that's just going to make your deal a little bit fatter. It won't make a huge difference, but hey, every dollar kind of adds up. So, and again, for guys, this is the, the the kid I was talking about, 21 years old, out of Detroit, Michigan, looking to get started in the business. Um, for anybody that wants to do like a one-on-one -on -one live strategy session with me, just shoot me an email and um, let me know. We're doing them. I'm doing them usually at 4 o'clock every day, so just shoot me an email to this email address if you want to do a, a full one-hour strategy session. Steve, do I private message you on Facebook with questions or just post the questions? Yes, yeah, so you post the questions in the group because I want your questions to be seen by everybody else who's in the group so that if somebody else in the group had the same question, they would then be able to see it. Um, the other thing about posting the question in the group is that sometimes I will get other people who I'm currently working with or sometimes even staff members in my office that will answer the question. So um, definitely post them in the group so everybody can see. Uh, Jay Gata, um, putting a deal up here, he's still, um, he, he put up basically a, a deal here that shows what he was going to offer on a property, the renovation budget, et cetera, with a bunch of different calculations. So um, he put in like all of these little these little different things, attorney's fees, appraisal, origination. This is totally unnecessary. So the only formula that you need to use is the 70% of ARV minus repairs. So when somebody does this, this, I've seen people get into a lot of trouble when they when they do calculations like this because they don't they'll miss expenses or they'll miscalculate an expense and they usually end up getting to this bottom line number here the profit at closing and what I see 99% of the time is that this number ends up being a lot higher than what the reality is so the profit at the closing is not the number that you want to look at um, because you may miss something. You always want to use 70% of ARV minus repairs. So even uh, even just these little my, these little kind of added calculations, they're just totally unnecessary. So what I would look at here is you've got the ARV at 265. I'd multiply that by 70% subtract out the repairs, and then get to what the purchase price ends up being. So in this case, I would take 265 times 0.7 minus his $45,000 reno budget to get to 14500 And he putting an offer for 145 So he putting an offer for $4,500 over 70 cents on the dollar. So he basically asked me, like, do I think this is a good deal? And my answer was that um, $4,500 over 70 cents on the dollar. For me personally, I wouldn't recommend this for somebody doing their first deal. If this was an area that I really, really liked and I felt 100% confident on these numbers, I might do it. But I wouldn't recommend it for somebody on their first deal. He's also getting 11% interest in four points. Four points is way, way too high to pay for hard money. Um, at max, you should be paying three points, um, but you should be able to get two points. We're in a market right now where it's really, really competitive uh, between one hard money lender and another. That, you know, there's, there's not a lot of deals for hard money lenders to lend on right now, and there's a lot of people with money so I would absolutely um, negotiate that down for sure.
Jewel, so with some of the funds we get for the program, is some of that being used for cold calling? Yes. Some of that is being used for cold calling. How can we avoid doubling the efforts if we wanted more cold calling done? It's just about the list. So I would just make sure that we cross-reference the addresses so that we're not calling the same people, um, so that we're not, like you said, kind of duplicating efforts on any calling. Um, it's not, although we don't want to do that, duplicating efforts on cold calling typically isn't as big of an issue as you might think because of the fact that like you're going to be hitting the same list over and over and over again so I'll call like I'll have my inside sales agents we have about 500,000 cell phone records and they just keep going through and going through and going through over and over and over again and same thing like with mailers and Facebook ads and Google we're hitting the same people over and over and over again and we're just simply waiting for those people to be ready. All right, I don't think there was anything else this week that came through on the Facebook group. So for those of you who are still on the line, type the questions that you have into the chat box. Um, if there's nothing else in a minute, I'm going to sign off just because I don't know what else uh, people need help with. But also let me know what, what training you need help with as well. So I definitely want to know um, what gaps there are in what we've pr been providing everybody so that we can help bridge those gaps. Um, and also just whatever else you guys want to learn about. So, you know, I want to make sure that the information is what you need. I don't know always, like, you know, I know what I know, but I don't necessarily know what you know or what you think you need to know. So if you let me know um, either via email or you can type it right into the, the chat box now on what topics you need help with, I'll make sure to deliver more content around that. Um, like always, so I'm available every single day from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern um, on my Facebook group. So. For those of you who do have any questions at all from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, I'm available every single day uh, for the full hour. And then obviously every day, every Thursday at 9 a.m. Eastern, we have these Q&A sessions. So uh, we're definitely available to help you. For those of you who are not utilizing my sales manager, that would also be a really good resource for all of you to use. It's free to you. Um, there's a lot of you know benefits of having a second opinion on different things. She may have a different opinion than me or a different angle on a few different things. So, um, all right guys, I don't see anything else coming in right now. So um, I'm gonna wrap up here and I will see everybody next Thursday at 9 a.m. or if not sooner, uh, probably you know at the, the Facebook Live sessions from 4 to 5 p.m. every day. So whatever else you guys need, let me know. If not, I will talk to you then. Thanks.